Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zeph from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I am with Nick Westerman of Hewn and Hone. Nick, how are you doing? Very well, and yourself? I'm doing very well, thank you. So if you're not familiar with Nick, Nick is a full-time professional tool maker, working primarily within the green woodworking community, tools that are commonly used by some of the best green woodworkers that are out there. We're here at a studio in rural Wales, and what we're doing on my particular visit to see Nick, what we're gonna be doing is we're in the process of filming an entire series and what you're watching now is a video that's part of that continuing series on making a turning slide knife. Now we've done a number of steps to get up to this stage and all the previous videos and the final video that comes after this particular video of the entire series are linked below in the description. So if you haven't seen all the previous videos in the series, I highly recommend you go check that out because what we're gonna do now in this particular video is Nick is gonna be talking through his process for shaping and handling a handle for the blade that we've made in this series. And he's gonna talk about a few nuances and a few tips and tricks along the way. Now, just a few quick things before we get on with the meat and bones of this video. As I mentioned, this is part of a broader series I'm filming with Nick. So all the other videos in this series are down below in the description. Also, what I'm gonna do, there's gonna be a few things referenced in this video that are from Hewn and Home, which is an outlet run by Nick. And so what I'm gonna do is put links to anything referenced in this video down below in the description. What I'm also going to be doing is putting a link to the Hunan Hone Instagram where you can see the plethora of work that Nick is getting up to within the Hunan Hone entity. And finally, as this video is covering a lot of different aspects of the handling process. Now to help facilitate that, what we've done is broken this video down into different chapters. So if you scroll along the timeline, you can see the different chapters marked out. Also the different chapters are also marked out down below in the description. On the left hand side are the times relating to that point in the video. YouTube has a very cool feature when you click it at that time, it will jump straight to that section rather than you having to manually scroll through. So like I said in this video, what we're gonna look at is the actual handling of the blade that we made in the previous videos. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. So then, before we begin the handling process, could you just do a very brief recap of what we've done in previous videos to get to this stage? Right, uh, well we started with round bar of this quarter inch section, uh, forged it out, and you can see the remains of the actual forged section here. We profiled it and then, well, it's been heat treated, so it's actually going to cut like a knife. Um, then we did the profile and then we've actually ground the bevels on and uh, we're very close to uh, a finished edge. It's sharp, but not dead sharp yet. It still needs a little bit of, little bit of work on, but it's better to do that uh, at a later stage. So, so with the handling yeah. process itself, where would you like to begin? Uh, well, we're going to start with a, a billet, which is you know, in a square section, um, but, uh, but otherwise it's to all the right dimensions or close to the dimensions I want. So how we'll start, there's two ways you can start really. I mean, it's very easy blade to, to handle because it's around tangs, so you drill a hole the right size and glue it in. Uh, what I wouldn't recommend, the way I wouldn't start is to actually at this point to drill a, drill a hole that size and glue it in and then try and shape it because you're going to cut yourself or damage the knife. But one option is to drill the hole first and then if it's a, well, if you've left yourself leeway, if you haven't drilled correctly, you can shape the handle to, to centre the blade. Uh, I'm relatively confident that my uh, rig for uh, drilling a hole in the, ha in the handle, uh, I've got a self-centering vise over there, should drill straight enough, so I'm going to assume that that'll be all right, so I'm just going to shape a handle and then drill a hole to suit. So uh, we'll see if that pays off, but it's a little bit quicker that way, rather than drilling and then going backwards and forwards a bit. So what I'm going to do is shape this into a handle now. It will roughly mimic something like this. Just one question just before you begin. Um, wood selection for handles, do you have a preference? Um, <laughs> yes, and here I'll contradict myself. Ash, ash is my wood of preference, but I haven't actually got any to hand uh, at the moment, which is, is going to be too good. So I've got some older, which is nice and soft and it's quicker and easier to shape. It's a, a little bit light. I mean, it's actually strong enough because uh, you're not going to be doing any real power cuts with this. Uh, it'll be all right, but it's uh, ash is probably my, my preference found. Or, well, if I had all the money and time in the world, then boxwood would be my preference for handles. But uh, 
it's not really economically viable. So ash, I think, works really well. And is it green or seasoned for the well, handle? <clears throat> Uh, if you're going to be shaping it yourself, I'd recommend shaping it um, in a, a semi-dry state, but not kiln-dried because it's easier. Uh, and then to be, you can glue it on in a bit of a green state because it's only going to shrink on, but you don't want it sopping wet. Uh, whereas uh, I've got this older, which is ever so dry, but it, older being older is nice and soft, which is sort of why I'm doing it. And it's easy. I don't have to wait for it to dry or anything. But... Um, yeah, uh, you don't want it too dry, but it's not the end of the world because it's only going to shrink on if it's not dry, not dry enough. So uh, that'd be my preference. So that was a uh, was that the RAF? Yes. Denver? Yes, and there may well be another one. They quite often come round in three, so we will see what happens. Yes. So to begin the process, what do you mm. want to do first? I will put this in shape horse, which is one that Lee Stoffer made for me a long time back. It's been tweaked a bit, but the basic design is, uh, is, is as is. And uh, it's one which sort of grips, I would say grips between centers, because if you have something which grips like this, you just have, haven't got the shape. I know you can use a spoon mule type design, but uh, this works well for me. So that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna start the shaping process. I've roughly marked centers and sort of where the breaks are. So I'll just uh, start shaping with a draw knife. So I'm going to, No, it didn't want to go that way. I was hoping I'd got it straight grained enough that I'd get away with that. And if people don't have this kind of horse to kind of clamp it in and or even a draw knife, with just a simple slide knife, Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's just what, what fits your hand and feels good, so yeah. So I'm leaving the widest point here and coming down. Oh, I'm not reading the grain very well, am I? roughly that'll do for the profile oh, no. there we go So is this the bottom of the handle or? Uh, this is the, uh, yeah, <laughs> concentrate too much, not messing it up. This is the, this is the, where the tang's gonna go. And this will be the, the back. isn't downhill unfortunately <laughs> I thought I'd split the thing out a bit straighter but that now I'll just put some facets on I tend to do uh, 12 sided facets but it seems to be easier to uh, to split a split octagonal so I 
as with like if it's starting to run out the more I skew the less chance it's got of coming out but right that's roughly octagonal now I'll just run some I'll split these into two Just try and chase these up. I'm not but this is all pretty. There's lots of people that make handles and probably do a equally good or better job it's nothing it's really just taking down the facets to you're happy with I'm not going to take keep taking it out and checking it in my hand because I just uh, get through getting that doesn't really want to go that way no So Nick, is that the kind of draw knife shaping complete? Yes, that's as much draw knifing as I want to do. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's reasonable enough. So what I've finished now is I'm just going to run some uh, facets off here, clean up the faces, and then it'll be ready to um, to drill it. And uh, I'll use one of our a, one of our slide knives to uh, to do that with. So this is a hewn and honed slide knife, yeah. Yes, yes, it's hollow ground, flat over hollow. Um, yeah, and this has actually got one of our large handles in. So we offer handles in three different sizes, and there's a large a medium, a small, and then this would actually be a, a sub-small because I've because <laughs> I've probably taken off more than I wanted. Uh, so this would be off the end of the, just off the end of the scale really, but uh, it's still okay as a handle. It's not like a knife you'd use really powerful strokes on, um, or it's for someone with small hands, which is what I've been talking about with sizing. Um, <clears throat> the way the sizing works on the handles which we, we sell is that the medium, which I don't have to, <laughs> to, have to hand, um, feels like a more a 106, which is the sort of general baseline uh, of handles. So rather than talk about you need a, this size hand for, for a large or a small, if a more a 106 feels about right in your hand, then you'd want a medium. If it feels a bit small, then you should be going for one of our large handles. And again, if a more 106 feels large and you're tending to carve it down a bit to fit and go for one of our smalls. So we offer handles in three different sizes. Currently, just in one shape, three different sizes, but eventually we'll expand that range and offer different style handles, but still three different sizes. So just to touch on mm. that briefly, so mm. when you mention the three sizes, okay, mm. um, and the handles, is that the handles that people can just 
get off you if you're hewn and hone, and then attach the own blade to, and or is that also the finished knives as well? That's the finished knives currently. I'm not selling handles. There's quite often they end up being being sort of bottlenecks in supply, and so so to keep it uh, uh, to, to sort of prioritise. Uh, putting the handles where I want them to go, which is on the knives. Uh, I'm just selling the, uh, the knives, um, just selling the handles as part of a finished knife currently. But uh, when I reach a point where I've got excess handles, then I'd sell the handles separately. The same with sheaves at the moment, they're just being sold uh, as a knife, uh, you know, as part of a knife. But if I've got excess sheaves, then I will sell them. But uh, that's one place where there's been a bit of a bottleneck. So I've just cleaned up the end grain here because it can get a bit marred here. And I'll just run the little facets around. An older is so soft, it's a bit unforgiving, I suppose, if the edge isn't perfect, but it does make it a little bit easier to get this out and it's dry if it was like really wet. Uh, but yeah, that's the handle. <coughs> and that's the blades going to go in. It's a slim blade and it sort of fits quite well with a slim handle. So that's about the orientation will go. So the next stage is going to be uh, it's going to be drilling, drilling the hole for the handle. So I'm ready to kind of drill the hole. Um, yes. So what's the first thing you're going to do? Uh, well, I'm going to look at this and it's not perfectly symmetrical. So I'll decide which I want to be the sort of the, the spine side and which will be the belly side of a blade uh, of a handle. To my eye, it will look better this way up than that way up. So we're going to be going that way. We're not going to, obviously we're going to drill the hole central in this orientation, but not that way. So I'll put the blade on and just line it up to where I think that it wants to be. And yeah, I have marked a little bit to give me a, so I want the hole to be here. It's obviously not going to be dead centre, but uh, about there. So once I know that, this is just an old knife which I've made into a rattle, but uh, And the mate, I mean, a half a mil out this way won't matter, but I don't, I want to make sure I'm dead center. I'm just looking down on it and make sure I'm centered there. And I'll open this out so I know I've got a reasonable size hole to uh, run through. Uh, <clears throat> it's a quarter inch tang. Uh, normally I use a slightly bigger metric uh, drill bit, not 6.5, but I've got a 6.3, which works quite well. But I found a quarter inch, uh, which I left at home, <laughs> but I've got a quarter inch drill bit here, which I think is going to be uh, close enough. It'll be a pretty tight fit. So this is a lovely thing. It's a self-centering drill. So it should put everything straight down the center, although obviously we're fractionally offset, but uh, the jaws are lined with leather on the inside of the hole so there's a little bit of leeway to uh, line stuff up so i'll just put it in run down and check that i'm yeah i mean that looks that looks good to me what you can do is just pull it over and when you're happy just tighten this up not too hard and so now i should be drilling straight down the center of it and uh just one thing, just yeah. before we do that. Mm. So if someone's watching, they don't have a drill press. Oh yes. Um, yeah. What are a couple of tips and advice you would give of using a normal handheld drill? Uh, well, you could have someone helping you. So if you put, say you put it in here and you're drilling in, say you're drilling like this and you've got your drill. I mean, it's, you can obviously sight left, right quite well. And then if you've got someone helping you for sighting up down, 
that that will work quite well. But probably if you haven't got a drill press and you're doing it freehand, I would recommend getting your blank slightly oversized, drilling the hole, and then um, if you've got, you could have a you could have a piece of dowel, a wooden dowel, and use that to give you an idea of where you've drilled and then shape the handle to fit your hole. That, that's a pragmatic solution to that. Um, and I may wish that's what I'd done if this hole doesn't drill. <laughs> to, but yeah, we'll, we'll see, yes. But yeah, that, that's probably the best way to do it if you don't have a drill press. So, and then the other thing you're gonna ask me, just one out is gonna, I think, it's worth asking me if I've plugged it in or not. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a really I can't recommend Draper drills not 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 enough but I can't recommend them uh, this really isn't a very nice drill but uh, it just anyway I'm committed now. Right. So in terms of how deep you go, how did you kind of figure that out? <coughs> Um, well, it doesn't really matter if you go too deep because you can fill it with epoxy. Um, I, I did actually have a bit of an, because I want to, I like to leave, because I've gone to the trouble of forging this, I don't want it to go all the way in. I mean, you could go all the way in here, uh, but I like to leave just a little bit of a shiny steel left so you're seeing the contrast between the shiny steel and the, so I eyeballed it and went that deep. That's my best guess. I, I'm not really one for measuring, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. Yeah. So much for drilling down the centre. But yeah. What I'll do... Oh, that's all right. It's going central this way. No, that's all right. I think the hole's ended up dead centre. Despite me marking it out, it must have dragged over quite a bit. It's not, it's not the best effort. What I'll do is I'll just put it in here and we will... Uh... Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm not very happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because it was an old... Oh, here's the excuses. Uh, it was an old quarter-inch drill bit which looked sharp, but maybe it wandered as it went down because although I'm all right, left to right, the holes ended up pretty much dead centre uh, despite me running it. So, yeah, not, not very happy with that. What I might do uh, <laughs> off-camera is just um, pull this out uh, and then just shape the top down to at least... I don't like this step here, so that's what I'll probably do. So Nick, have mm. you kind of just kind of refined that handle just a tad bit? Refined's a diplomatic way of putting it, but <laughs> yes, yes, I've, I've, I've corrected it. Yes, corrected my shoddy drilling. Uh, I've taken the top down, so I think it looks quite nice as a handle now. It's a, it's a, you could argue that the, uh, the slim handle um, you know, mirrors a slim blade, but uh, you know really why it's a slim. <laughs> but yeah, but it, it's fixed. Uh, that's, I'm quite happy with that. So I'm going to pull the handle, pull the blade out now. Um, normally I'd use round jawed pliers because they're less likely to mark the surface, but I've left them at home. You can see it's quite a good fit, so it's not really gonna need much in the way of glue. So I will uh, put that down. I always like to oil, give it a quick oil first, because it, if you have any epoxy, uh, which is in the, um, which ends up on the surface of the wood, it doesn't sink into it and stain it to the same degree. So oil it just acts, obviously you don't want to get oil down in the hole because it's not going to work. Uh, and I'm using this uh, peacock oil from Skelton Saws. It's their old stuff, which has got turpentine in and smells wonderful. I'm not gonna, so I'll just, and there's a, hopefully, you can see I've got quite a lot of dirt in the facets despite trying to wash my hands, but you can see it's coming out. 
because uh, it's got quite a high solvent content it tends to strip the dirt out quite nicely and uh, recover it quite well yeah that's a little bit more well because it, it does soak in very well And this is the oil you use on pretty much all your handles? Yes, yes, it's a very good oil, yes, it's, uh, it's, yeah, so he doesn't actually make this version anymore with the turpentine in because I think he had difficulty uh, posting it because of it, so I got some, uh, he, well he actually gave me a big load of it actually, uh, which I, it's a beautiful oil. And yeah, that's stripped all the, uh, the dirt out of the handles and it looks a lot better. And there's not a lot of grain in uh, grain to see in, uh, in older, but it's come out and there's, uh, this should act as a bit of a release for when I glue it in. So <clears throat> normally I do big batches, so I'll use a slow epoxy. Uh, but just, just one thing actually, yes. I, I forgot Sorry. we, uh, I forgot to mention, we were talking about off camera, and that is when you oil, you typically leave it for... Yes, I would leave it overnight to dry because it gives a much better seal against the epoxy. But again, we, we haven't got time for that and it, anything will help, but it'd be better to put uh, to let it dry and then the oil, the epoxy will wipe off a lot easier, I think. So that's what I normally do. Uh, and I normally do big batches, so I'll use a slow epoxy, but I found some five minute Araldite, which is looking a bit grotty, but uh, so we've got very good, uh, you could almost use this with no, um, with no glue in it, it grips pretty well. So I think we'll get, get by uh, if, yeah, that's all right. We obviously don't need much because it's such a good fit. And the other thing I should say is I know that a lot of people are really um, up on like roughening the tang and degreasing and everything, but I, the amount of surface area you've got compared to the amount of torque on the blade, uh, I've never had one come loose. And if I've ever tried to take them out, they haven't come out that easily. So I'm not too big on that. I'm quite happy to just glue this in as is. Uh, I'll mix up the epoxy and try and get that nasty out of there. And sometimes uh, old epoxies go off lightning quick, so five minute epoxy will turn into 30 second epoxy. So it might be a bit of a race against time with this. You'd have thought they'd get slower and not work as quickly, but it seems to be the other. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, normally I'd spend a bit of time gluing it, but not today, so. What I would normally do is pour epoxy in at the top and let it settle to the bottom and uh, run down, but so I'm not sure for, and the other thing I'd normally do is be very careful to tap all the dust out so you don't get uh, wood dust on it, but like that. So that's that. And I know it's a really good fit, so I don't need much, but I might as well just sort of wet the surface so it's got a chance of, rather than it releases. One thing which can happen if you get a really good fit um, and it's a bit loose, you can it can act like a, a piston, like the air compresses and then it just pops out again. So sometimes you have to watch that you put it in and then it just presses out. I think we'll be all right. Yeah, I think I've hit the bottom of the, uh, the glue is is filled the bottom of the hole, so I didn't glue a very deep hole. But that's yeah. I quite like leaving a little bit of um, a little bit of a tail that it's actually been forged. Uh, again, if I was honest, I'd prefer it to go in. <laughs> I can't get it any further. 
we'll stick with that but I'll make sure that it's uh, running straight up and down the so this is where you do your final adjustment? Yes, yeah, the final adjustment is just that it's tracking up and down. I mean, uh, at least I managed to drill straight this way. It's looking, that's tracking nicely. I can't adjust that, but I can, uh, I can adjust that the blade is running up and down. And I can see now where the drill wandered. There's a little bit of a gap at the top there. And I might, oh, I might just be able to let a bit of epoxy run in there. Yeah, the drill was obviously wandering a lot, which is... I'll just let that sit for a little bit. I'm hoping it'll go off quite quickly. And you can use your oily rag too. Let's see, I've got a lump on here. That should come away quite quickly. So this is where you clean off the potential yes. residue? Yeah, so I've got a little bit smeared here and the oil helps to... release it. And what I tend to do, I mean, normally I'd then go on to the next one. Uh, I've got an idea of how quickly the whole thing goes off. But if you don't know how quickly it goes off, cause sometimes you don't want to smear it. That's still running in quite nicely, actually. That's looking all right. But I'll have a look at, you get an idea of what the glue's acting like from here. And it's, it's still running, it's still all right. So I'm not in any hurry to, to clear it up. It's starting to gel, but it's not impossible to smear off. It's a bit easier to clean up at a bit of a later stage, so I'd probably leave it a little bit, but I'll start clearing now because... <clears throat> I mean, I know a lot of people really don't care, and it obviously doesn't matter, but it's quite nice. I think it's quite nice to clean this up. So what I'll do at this point is start wiping around something you mentioned off camera about the colour of tissue or kitchen towel that you're using. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, if, you're, if you use a, a coloured one, because you've oiled first, uh, the oil in the wood can strip any uh, dye out of the kitchen towel. And uh, I did this once with, you know, you can get the blue industrial cleaning ones. They're quite often blue, probably to stop people <laughs> taking them home. Uh, I did that once and the oil uh, stripped the dye out and the wood took on a blue colour, which uh, it wasn't my favoured favored look, so yeah. But generally oiling uh, does help with this clean up. So that's come pretty good. I'll just rub it out of here. And I spend way too long on this because it doesn't matter. I mean, you look down most knives, they're not perfect and it makes no difference, but it's just something I've always done. <clears throat> and if you want to finish off, you can use your oily rag, which you might not have had if you did it the day before, just to clean up the metal and make sure there's nothing where you don't want it to be. That's it, a little bit proud, I have to say, but as, as I say, it was, the glue had gone, um, it was a little bit stiff already. Normally I'd have, uh, um, it would have been a bit more runny and you can press it in and then it comes out the top, but it had already gone off a little bit. But uh, that is a long, slim handle put on. So when you leave it to dry, do mm. you lay it down? Do you put it on upwards or...? Um, well, I know that this one is such a tight fit, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, but normally I would leave them 
and leave them upright because then any glue will will sink in rather than run out or if it's like a, if there is a bit of slop in the handle to the tang then then I'd leave it so I would leave it upright but I know that there's not enough fillet of wood there to uh, not enough fillet there's not enough uh, fillet of glue for it to sag and run I wouldn't be too fussed about which way but it's it's safer well <laughs> it's safer for a knife uh, the aesthetics of a knife to leave it like that but it just it's not very safe to leave a whole forest of knives like that. But as we're both adults, I think we'll risk it, yeah. So, Excellent. that's it. Um, yeah. And just one final question I have for you in regards to this. So obviously you use a five minute epoxy. Hmm. Um, do you always kind of typically leave it longer to be on a safe side or how do you kind of measure that? Uh, I'd always leave them overnight. Uh, I mean, it's five minutes sort of uh, working time. It's not that it's actually properly gone off after five minutes. So yes, I'd leave it longer uh, uh, overnight generally, but, but five minutes will, in a hot day. I mean, it's, it's temperature dependent as well, uh, but uh, you, you get an idea of how hard it's gone off, but it's, it's better to leave it longer really. Um, I'd say maybe an hour is all right with five minute epoxy, uh, but uh, I think five minute relates to the working time, not the actual full strength uh, that it comes up to but we don't need full strength. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, that was really insightful, once again, uh, for me to see that. And obviously, you know, there was a bit of an issue with the drill, but it actually worked out because that could potentially happen to you. So we kind of, obviously, Nick can ha then have the opportunity to talk through how to rectify that. Um, but overall, like I said, this video is the continuation of a series where we started out from literally a raw piece of steel all the way to this finished product. And what we're going to be looking at the final installment of this series on the turning slide knife is we're going to be looking at Nick's a process for sharpening and maintenance of the knife. So if you want to check that video out, which I highly recommend you do, a link to that will be down below in the description, as well as all the previous videos in this series. Links for all of those will be down below in the description. Also, Nick has referenced some of the components and materials, etc., used in this knife build and in this entire series. So anything referenced in this particular video will also be linked down below, which you can get directly from the Hewn and Hone website. And finally, what I'm going to be doing, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I will also be putting a link to the Hewn and Hone Instagram. It will mean the world to me if you're getting any value from this video whatsoever to give Hewn and Hone a follow on Instagram and you can see the myriad of work that they're getting up to. And lastly, a recap, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this video has been broken up into the different chapters. So if you scroll along the timeline of this video, you can see all the different sections marked out. And also those chapters are down below in the description with the times on the left-hand side. And YouTube has a very cool feature. If you click on those times, it will jump straight to that section. So you don't have to manually scroll through. The, the whole idea and philosophy behind these videos and something Nick was very eager to do is to kind of teach as much as he can, which is taking many, many years to hone and refine and to kind of share that with you so it would help you on your journey. So using that timestamp feature will help you kind of come back to this video as a resource and kind of skip through different sections when and as is applicable for you as you're doing this yourself. So like I said, links to everything down below in the description and I shall see you on the final video of this series where we're going to be looking at some sharpening and maintenance. So Nick, uh, a sincere thank you uh, once again. Oh, um, you, links to everything down below in the description and I shall see you on the next video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Nick Westerman of Hewn and Hone and myself, Zell Outdoors, peace out.